So last time we were going through the mass shooting data. I got a come I got a comment back on the on the comment stickies at the end of class uh, last Thursday, which said something along the lines of, "It's nice to finally be working with real data." <laughs> All the data we've been working with are real. They've just been textbook examples. This is just kind of the first, one of the first data sets that we've generated sort of ourselves. Uh, but anyway, I, I hope that you're enjoying talking about death and carnage. So um, we were in the process of looking at um, the mass shooting data set, which summarizes the number of mass shootings, the number of people killed, and then we did some mathematical uh, calculations to scale that to population, and then we looked at the number of kills per incident. And kills per incident is what we were looking at at the end, and you can see that um, this is not a significant correlation. Uh, the slope value is actually higher than the other slope values, but you see that there's a lot of variation from year to year in terms of the uh, number of individuals per mass shooting that are killed in, in a given year. And so um, the main reason for this thing being flat is because early on you had a couple of large mass shootings that ended up killing a, a lot of people, and uh, you still have a lot of those. It's just that there's a lot of variation around the line. Plus that, that slope is still, all these slopes are really close to a slope of zero. The question is, are they significantly different from a slope of zero that you can detect? So that has everything to do with how much variation there is around the line. So the last thing that I kind of left you with was, uh, let's subset the data. And I was trying to do it in tidyverse, and one of the things I need to do with my time probably this coming summer is just sit down and teach myself tidyverse in the same way that I taught myself R. So I went back over the weekend and just reverted to base R. In base R, you can just run the subset command run it on the data frame that you want to run, and then give it the conditions that you want to subset. So in this case, I want it to subset the dat1 data file with uh, all of the data except 2020 data and 2021 data to essentially get rid of these two presumed outliers right here, the low numbers in 2020 and the incomplete data from 2021. And that should give that to you. And when you look at that too, you should see that it goes down to 2019 and stops. So uh, run that subsetting and save that as a different data frame. Yeah. Uh, did you load all your packages? Yes, which is really strange because it worked last time. But yeah, even I hate it when this crap happens. No rerun all of them, and it, it works fine. It's like it, it doesn't like the. Okay, what's going on? Apply functions clear test. It does it for the NCC too. All applicable. Did it give you residuals? Mm-hmm. This one works fine. Okay. Uh, I've tried closing R. Wait. Oh, that should prove. That's killed. Okay. So you ran that. What's, what does the little warning tell you? Sharpio. Sharpio is not Shapiro. You have misspelling. Misspelling rears its ugly head. See if that works now. Shapiro, Shapiro, not Prio, IR. You got dyslexia this morning. Yeah. There it goes. All right, cool. All right. Let me know when you've when you've caught up. NCVT. Oh, NCV test. Okay, all right. Yep. All right. So that's okay. So, what is it saying? It could be. Okay. Wait. Well, no. You don't run it on residuals. You run it on the model. Mm -hmm. So whatever your model name is.
Okay. Sorry. Did that, did that run? No? Yeah, there it goes. Yep. Follow the instructions on the board and let us know when you've caught up to okay. us. If, for those of you who are caught up, uh, go ahead and rerun the count per million test and the killed per million test and the um, killed per incident. So run those regressions again on this now reduced data set. And when you have that, uh, just come up here and fill in the blanks um, so that we can see what the equations for the relationships are for the full data and what happens to them when we remove these two, uh, these two last two year outliers. So it's the same code that you have before, you're just changing the data frame that the code is working on. Chance you caught up now? Okay. <laughs> did you do this in class last time? Were you here last time? How did? I think I renamed them after we were doing everything. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. That's the bummer about messing stuff with stuff that works. Sometimes you're like, oh, I'm going to clean this up, and all it does is make your life a living hell. I'm just running through it all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's where we were. Okay. So now what we're doing is we are subsetting the data. So. Subset by creating a new data frame, call it whatever you want. Subset your original data frame by anything in the year less than 2020. That'll get your, rid of 2020's data and 2021's data. And then look at the full data set to make sure that it did it. Do you have the analyses run? Mm -hmm. I'm working on getting the other. Okay. Okay. And then once you have that, uh, rerun all the analysis that we ran before, which was counts per million by year, killed per million by year, and killed per incident by year. So it looks like everybody's everybody's working on that. So let me get caught up to you guys.
Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Did you check your data file to make sure the subsetting worked? Okay, hold on just a minute. See what you got. Sorry. Okay, so let me see your data. Okay, it gave you that. So let me see where you're running your models. Uh, I ran them right here. Okay, show me in your in your script. Right here. Oh well, you can't do that because. You have, have to, to change the, you have to oh, change the data. Oh, I would copy okay. paste and then change the data frame. Yep. Yeah. So you're still running it on your on your original okay. data set. Yep. That's why I had you uh, save the new data under a different data frame because you can copy the old, old code, change the data frame, and then I'll do it. So let me know when you've got that done. Okay. Okay. So what we see if we if we look at the statistical models, if we look at the linear regressions that we get out of these things, you can see that in all cases, the slopes have increased just slightly, just ever so slightly, when we got rid of those two outliers, because these two outliers were dragging down all the regressions. So if we go and flip through our graphs, These two outliers down here are going to be dragging down the line from these these points up here because 2020 was an aberration because we were under pandemic lockdown for a large portion of the year. And 2021 is not even a complete year's worth of data yet because we're still here at the end of April. And these data are now like you know a week and a half old. So what we can do to get a more realistic view of what the relationship is, is just remove those two recent data points. And you see that the graph here um, now lacks those data points. And the slope is higher, but it's not, it's not super high relative to what it was before. It's in, increased one ten thousandth. Uh, here it's increased uh, one hundredth. Here it's increased I'm oh, sorry, 1,000th, and here it's increased uh, 3 hundredths. And so it has increased the slope somewhat, but it hasn't changed non-significant things to significant. So this was significant, this was significant, this was not significant, 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 not significant. So all the same results are, are qualitatively the same. It's just that now the slopes are slightly higher because you got rid of these two these two years of data that were kind of dragging down the regression. Well, one of the things that you can do with a regression slope, remember that a regression slope is just like 
I mean. The regression line is basically the running average of the y values as the x values change. So as x goes from some low value to some high value, y in this case also goes from some low value to some high value. So the point on the line represents the average of y for this particular value of x. At this particular value of x, what is the average of y? At this particular value of x, what is the average of y? So you can think of the line as the equation that you can use to calculate what's the expected average value of y for any given value of x. And the thing that determines that relationship is the slope value. So in the same way that you can compare a mean of sample 1 to a mean of sample 2 to see if those two means are different or not. You can also compare the slope value of one regression with the slope value of another regression. So for counts per million, we have two regressions. We have a regression line that is for the full data set, and we have a regression line that is based on this reduced data set. If we create a data frame that contains the data set in its full form and the data set in its reduced form, we should be able to test to see whether or not this change in slope from this to this, whether those two slopes are different. Now, chances are they're not going to be different because the actual values of the slopes are still very similar, but we can actually run the test to see if they are significantly different from one another. So what I've put on the Moodle site is a new data file called slopecop.csv. So go and get that, save it under a new data frame name. When you get a summary of it, it will show you that it now has 78 values rather than whatever it was before. And uh, we might as well just actually view the data. So let me know when you are at this point where you have viewed the data and you have uh, the data available to you in its complete, complete form. Whoa. So do these three lines of, of code. Then put your blue sticky up when you've got there. Hayden's like, I'm so there. I'm already there. I'm way ahead of you. Oh, I didn't get you sticky notes. We weren't here when I put out the sticky notes. All right. So the reason I wanted you to view the data is so that you can see how the data are structured. So we have a new column now in this data set that tells you what the comparison is. In this case, there's the full data set. And if you scroll down, the full data set goes all the way through 2021. And then right after that, you get the reduced data set that starts in 1982 and should only go all the way down to 2019. Okay? 
so this just has the two data sets duplicated, but one has two fewer years than, than the other. Well, now what we can do with this is we can actually build a new model, and I'm just going to call this new model slope comparison one. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the number of, well, I started with killed per million. I don't know why I did that, but we'll start with killed per million. And we want it to be described by not only year, but also by this comparison, comparing the full data set to the reduced data set. And because what because you're looking at a regression where you have one continuous variable versus another continuous variable, but you also include this um, this um, categorical variable, what it's going to do is it's going to run an analysis of covariance, which we haven't talked about yet, but that's actually the next topic that we're going to deal with. But for right now, what's important is when we when you code it this way, it's going to give you the interaction of year and comparison with one another. So just trust me that I know what I'm doing and just run that. And then when you're done, don't get the summary, but get the summary ANOVA table. So, so run summary.aov on that model. And what you should see is an ANOVA table that looks like this. Put your stickies up if you got this. I get the output, yeah. So comparison one. So we're going to do three different ones, actually. OK. So everybody has this. Take your stickies down. So what you see is that in this ANOVA table, there's an effective year. There's an effect of the comparison, and there's an effect of the year by comparison interaction. And I'll explain what this means in a few minutes graphically. But there's still an effective year because obviously year influences how many mass, how many people are killed per million in mass shootings. But there's no difference between the two data sets in the the actual number of people killed per million. Because once again, the data sets are virtually identical in this case, except for the lack of those last two years. But what we're really running this for is to get this interaction term. And you see that this interaction term is not significant. The p-value is much higher than 0.05. And what that's telling you is that these slopes didn't change. So to illustrate to you what this interaction is that we're calculating, let's graph both of these data sets on the same, on the same graph. And so what we're going to do to do that is we're going to start with your simple ggplot syntax. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to plot this new data file, whatever you save the data frame in. Year is still on the x-axis. Killed per million is still on the y-axis. But add group equals comp and color equals comp. This will tell ggplot to divide the data into these two groups, the full data set and the reduced data set. Now, this is just the first line. We're going to want to plot regression lines. So what would we use to plot regression lines and the confidence intervals around these regression lines? 
GM Smooth. Once we have the lines, we're going to want to plot point And once we have points, we might just want to make the graph a little cleaner. And so when you are done with all that, run it and see what it gives you. Put your stickies up when you've got the figure generated. Okay, good. Stickies down. So what you see in this figure is you see a bunch of blue points and two pink points. But what's graphed actually is both plots. So the full data set is in pink. But because it comes first in the data set, it gets plotted. And then the second thing, which is the reduced data set, gets plotted on top of it. And so because the data set is exactly the same, the two data sets are exactly the same, except for these two points, all of the reduced dots are overlaid on top of the pink dots. And so when you do this, it's something that's, that's known in graphing as overplotting, where you can't see all the data because some data are literally sitting right on top of other data. But you know that you have both sets in there because you have two regression lines. You have two, these two points that we removed to create the reduced data set. And remember that these confidence intervals that are the gray bands around the lines, these are the confidence intervals for the slope of the line. And the way, one way you can intuitively think about this is if this is the regression line, and the confidence interval around the slope, all at, at the average value of x, all values of the slope that you can fit within these confidence intervals, all of those slopes are not different from one another because they all fit within the confidence interval of the slope. If you encounter a slope that lies outside of that confidence band, that then is a slope that is different from the slope that you are observing. And so in this case, what we see is, are the slopes different? Yes, they have numerical values that are different, but they're only slightly different. But it's easy to see that the pink slope falls within the blue slope's confidence intervals, and the blue slope falls within the pink slope's confidence intervals. And so for this reason, we find that they are not significantly different. So what would a significant interaction term have looked like? Well, in this case, the interaction is between year and comp, which is the full data set versus, versus the, the reduced data set. And what this means is that, what that means is that for, if this is the slope of the full data set, the slope of the reduced data set would have had to have been something different such that the way the number of killed per million is affected by x at low values of x x affects kill per million in one way 
But at high values of x, x of x kills per million in a different way. So it's the same way that we would define the interaction term in a two-way ANOVA, where you have discrete treatment levels, and the interaction is such that one treatment level affects the other treatment one way at one value of the first treatment, and another way at a different value of that, that treatment. Same thing here. X affects kill per million one way. At low values of X, it affects it a different way at high values of X. And so to see the interaction term be significant, these lines would either have to be diverging from one another, they would have to be converging with one another, or they would have to be crossing in some way. So once again, the slopes of these lines, as long as they're parallel or roughly parallel, you don't have an interaction, which basically means that the slopes are essentially parallel with one another. And so this interaction term, the interaction is the test of parallelism. Are these slopes similar to one another? Are they essentially parallel? Or is there some evidence to say that they are not parallel? And we could do this with killed per million. We could do it with the incident, which is um, counts per million. The number, the number of individual incidents per million. And once again, we would still see there is no significant interaction. The plot of that looks like this. And we could also do it with the, um, the number of kills per incident as well, but that's going to give you the same answer. And that relationship wasn't significant to begin with. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't actually do that one in preparation for today. But basically, these graphs show you the two data sets and shows you the two slopes. And you can intuitively see that those two slopes are not different from one another. So one of the things that you might occasionally want to know, and if you think back to the um, to the um, COVID-19 data set at the beginning of the semester. Speaking of real world data. Where is that? One of the things that we did when we when we were looking at this data set is we did a thing called segmented regression, which we won't go into the details of. But now that you know what regression is about, maybe it'll make more sense to you. But we basically um, looked at four regressions. We looked at a regression that looked at uh, mandated counties. We looked at unmandated counties, and we looked at them before the mask mandate came into effect and after the mask mandate came into effect. And so we essentially had these four regressions. This is the R markdown file. So we had these four regressions. And in the counties that had mask mandates before the mandate came into effect, they were increasing rapidly in terms of the number of cases. And the same thing was happening in the non-mandated counties. But one of the things that the researchers who put this data set together initially said was that essentially the slope didn't really change in the unmandated counties. And you can see that this slope, it's pretty easy to envision how this slope would fit within the confidence interval of this slope. So they didn't see that there was a significant change in slope here. But this was the slope of the line after the mandates took effect in those counties that mandated masks versus this. And it's very difficult to imagine this slope 
fitting inside of the confidence interval of that slope. So we can actually go back and, and look at those data, and I think those that data set is on your on your um, I think the data set itself is on the the Moodle site. You could actually actually you don't even have to alter the data because the data are all already divided up into these different time periods, and they're already divided up by mandated and non-mandated. And you could actually just look at mandated versus non-mandated versus um, the two time periods before the mandate came into effect and after the mandate came into effect. And you could actually run a comparison of slopes uh, analysis. And what you would find is that there would be a significant interaction term in this case. Because the days since mandate doesn't change. So the, the days since mandate has an effect on the number of COVID cases, but that relationship between days since the mask mandate and COVID relationship don't really change at all over the course of the entire data set for the non-mandated counties, but it changes drastically for the, the mandated counties. And so this would be another way in which you could use the test of a difference of slopes, this parallelism of lines test, to test whether or not this change in slope is actually significant or not. So just another another application of using this particular thing. Uh, the next topic that we are going to talk about is um, an analysis of covariance where we might have two treatments like mandated or non-mandated but the response variable in this case, which is the number of COVID cases, might change with some X variable. So um, in this case, the X variable is the, the date and the time sequence of when the mandates came into effect. And then you're looking at how that, is, how that has affected the um, number of cases in mandated counties versus mandated counties. But you have to remove the effect of days since the mask mandate as a covariate in the same way that if you were looking to see if males and females ran faster, you know, if there was a difference in sprint speed between males and females, uh, you would want to, for example, um, factor in the height of individuals because people with longer legs might run faster than people with short legs. And so you might have height as a covariate so that you could look at males and females irrespective of height. You could statistically remove the influence of height. And that's what an analysis of covariance does. It's like an analysis of variance, but you have this X variable that affects your response variable, and you want to control for that, that X variable. One of the assumptions of an analysis of covariance, analysis of covariance has all of the same assumptions that an analysis of variance has but it has a couple of additional ones, and one of them is that the lines that you're comparing are parallel to one another. And that's why, that's why in R we can test for parallelism this way, is because we're basically running an analysis of covariance on, on the data. So uh, I want you to read a chapter about the analysis of covariance before we start going into that. So I'll post that on Moodle. Uh, we seem to be lacking a bunch of people today, so uh, I wasn't planning on starting ANCOVA today uh, anyway, but it's a good thing that, that I wasn't planning on doing that um, because I want you to read this chapter. The chapter is a, is a chapter from a book that was published back in the 1980s, but it's kind of the clearest, most intuitive treatment of what an analysis of covariance is that I've, that I've read in my entire life, I think. And so uh, I want you to read that before we start talking about the analysis of covariance in detail. And so I think that's, that's going to be it for us for today. Uh, with the time that we have left, do you have any questions about the two-way ANOVA report that you are working on? It help that you've already looked at the data once before? Okay, good. I was hoping that that would help. Does the output from the two-way ANOVA make sense in terms of things like interpreting the interaction term in the two-way analysis of variance? So in this case, there should be a significant interaction term, right? Yep, there is.
All right, then. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, fill out your sticky notes, and I will see you guys on Wednesday, unless you have questions. Uh, I sent out an email last week uh, on the comment sheets, on the little stickies last week. Somebody wrote that they were really concerned about you know, how the two-way ANOVA was going to go. Obviously, if you have those concerns, it's nice to see you expressing those on a sticky note, but a better way to express that is just to come and see me in my office if you're having trouble with it. So I don't know who who that sticky note came from, but but if you're having difficulties, by all means, come and see me. You can ask Hayden or Chance or Samuel if I'm available and helpful in office hours, and hopefully they'll say, yes, he is, because I've seen, I've seen you guys a number of times in my office. So just let me know what you need, and we will get you taken care of. Save your script that you were working on today so that you don't lose that, that information.